Today I'm speaking with Hans Rosling, Professor of International Health, Statistician and Jedi Master at Data Visualization. Hans, thank you for coming in. Thank you very much for having me. You've become famous for your ability to convey complex ideas through the use of statistics uh, and data visualization tools. What was it that got you interested in communicating in that way? Actually, I'm not interested in numbers at all. I'm interested in the world and in people and their lives. But you can't understand the world if you don't grasp numbers. Order of magnitudes, speed of change. Those are the two things you have to understand. And if you don't use numbers, you don't appreciate the change in the world. You will get stuck with your old worldview that falls down to Tintin or some colonial concept of the West and the rest. So it's, it's actually to force yourself to see what is happening to the human beings in this world that you have to use the numbers. So to you, numbers are more of an objective lens through which to see the world and the changes in the There's world. There's an intermediate between people's life, economies and resources on one side, you know, and our concept and understanding on the other side. The reality has to pass through numbers, but then you have to take it out of the numbers again. You have lots of numbers here on the wall behind me, I see, you know. <laughs> but, but really, it's the interpretation of the numbers that are important. Yes, the last week, people were saying, oh, there's a slowdown in Chinese economy. It's falling from 7.2 to 6.9. 6.9? And then in Europe, we are celebrating an increase from 0.9 to, 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 to 1.2. You have to have the order of magnitude. Understanding that as China gets richer and richer, their growth rate will slow down. To me, the slowing down of the growth rates in China just means that they are coming closer and closer to West Europe and North America. So that's, that's what I mean with, with numbers. Not the number itself, it's the interpretation of it. In 2005, I think it was, you founded Gapminder Foundation uh, with your son and your daughter-in-law. Um, tell us a bit about what Gapminder is to you and, and how it's seeking to achieve its goals. It is joining the experience of the three of us, you know, me being an analyst of development and an academician, my uh, daughter-in-law being a sociologist and a very good uh, person for understanding people's perceptions. She's a photographer also, now user experience expert. And, and my son being a good numerical person who could write code but also a designer. He almost made it to the Academy of Art and was first reserved two years in a row before he started with this. So it was putting us together and making numbers visual to everyone in a way that they could understand. That is what has been unique and it paid off so much. I could tell you that we have our mission statement is fighting devastating ignorance about the world with a fact-based worldview that everyone can understand. So this is the challenge. But it wasn't so heroic in the beginning. You know, when my son first said, I can help you with those graphics, you know, but I need a better computer. And I said no to him. You can use my old computer that I gave you. And then he came back next and no, I need this new software that can write animation. I really need a new, I've, I've gone to the bank, I can get a loan if you sign up for security. No, I won't do that, you know, you just take a lot of risks, I said. And then he found a publicly funded computer eh, from government money on which he wrote the first software version. Can you imagine? I missed that investment three times. And here I sit now, eh? <laughs> being famous due to what my son and his wife created. It's extremely difficult to see innovations coming. It's embarrassingly difficult to see innovations coming. And uh, what they could do with the software was to make animation, to show time as a movement. For so many years, we had time on the horizontal axis. And then we showed money. And we made another graph where we had time on the horizontal axis, and then we showed life expectancy, our health improved. Now, we could put money on one axis, income. We could put health, life expectancy on the other axis. Exit. And then the movement showed the time. And that was the eye-opener for people to see how countries got 
richer and richer, they also got healthier and healthier, and richer and richer and healthier and healthier. Whereas some got healthy first and then rich, like China. Actually, what's happening today in the world is another sequence of events. And that's so very clear when we could animate it over time. Of the, of the things that Gapminder is trying to achieve, where do you think that you have been uh, successful and where do you think that you still have ground to make up? I think we've been successful in showing that you can make data understandable, that you can innovate in showing data. The main task we have to upgrade the worldview, it's a long way to go. It's a very, very stubborn idea that the West is far ahead of the rest in the world. And this idea that there is a dichotomy in the world, with a developed world and a developing world, that is so stuck. People talk about developing countries without having any criteria. The difference in income per capita in what we call developing countries is 25-fold from $500 per person to $12,500 per person. And you try to comprehend that as one group. It's ridiculous. Half the world economy today is outside the OECD. And it will just continue to increase. And so instead of a division by developed and developing economies, how do you see a better way of understanding uh, divisions or categories. When within. I buy t-shirts, they don't have large and small, they have medium. Have you noted that? I think you fit in medium quite well, isn't it? Huh? What if you came out and they ask you, do you want large or do you want small? No, I want medium. No, we have no medium. Huh? You are either large or you are small. We have one billion people in high income countries, huh? which is above $12,000. We have one billion in low-income countries, which is below $1,000. Those who are poorer than Ghana, those who are richer than Poland. Those are the two extreme groups. In the middle, we have five billion people. The upper middle is like China. The lower middle is like India. Like China is Turkey, Brazil, uh, Thailand, you know, huge countries. Uh, like India is Vietnam, you know, Ghana, Nigeria. So understand the middle. And, and, and we used to ask people, out of 10 young girls in the world, between 7 to 13 years old, how many go to primary school? It's nine today. It's nine. I'm upset that it's not 10. But most people think it's five. But it's not. Out of 10 persons in the world, how many have electricity at home? It's eight. Out of 10 one-year-olds in the world today that should have get vaccinated, how many have got measles vaccine, the most important? Well, it's eight and a half, 85%. We have most of the world in decent life, that is middle-income countries. They vaccinate their kids, they send the girls to school, they have a lamp at home, they use contraceptives, they have two child families. Eight out of 10 persons in the world live in societies with two child families today. That idea, that, that eight out of ten in the modern world, that hasn't gone through. And that's so important for the economy of the world. Because it's with a two-child family and better schooling that the economic growth starts. In the past, with the Industrial Revolution, when the children of Britain was down the coal mine, working, then the economy was growing before human resources improved. Now in the world, it's the other way around. First, you get schooling, basic health, contraceptive, two-child families. Then you get this fantastic economic growth. So how do you incorporate that type of thinking and understanding of the world into um, policy decisions? How do you get policymakers into global institutions to think about uh, the distribution of uh, health and wealth in that way? And form policies accordingly? By forcing them to learn it in school. You see? I speak relatively good English because I was forced to learn it at school. If I didn't pass my test in English, I wouldn't go to medical faculty. Eh? So I had to learn English. Eh? And, 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 and when you have a driving license, you must learn when it's green, drive. When it's yellow, careful, red, stop. You have to learn about the world. It's pathetic that we graduate children from secondary school and university students without learning basic facts about the world. 
and we don't have a mechanism but upgrading it. I don't criticize media. Stop doing that. Uh, teaching institutions. In, in the factfulness project that Gapminder uh, is starting now, we want to make a test whether people know the world or not. And we'll make it available for all major corporations in the world. And when they call someone for an interview, they will first have to pass the test of global factfulness. And if they don't pass that, they won't be called for an interview. That will have an effect. Then they will learn. Huh? Because this is so basic things. And it's not about ideology. It's not, we don't do advocacy. We don't do consultancy. We just teach how to drive in the traffic. That is, how to understand the world. This basic knowledge will be out there. Hans, it's been fantastic speaking to you. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you very much.